The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with the New Society, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals they're helping to shape it. On today's show, I have Dr. Stephen Barnhill and Rod McIlroy. Stephen is president and Rod is an investor and advisor to Apollon Formularies PLC. They are a medical cannabis company based in Jamaica. Guys, welcome. How are you doing? Great. Good morning. Thank you. It's a good afternoon to where you are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. How are you guys doing today? You all right? Where are you guys respectively in the world? I'm doing terrific. I'm in Houston, Texas right now. Fantastic. Rod? In London, England, uh, down, uh, down in Piccadilly area. Ah, okay. Not far from me then. That's good. Thanks for joining us. We're going to be talking about Jamaica, actually, which is, you know, for many reasons, got a lot of connections with cannabis. So we'll get into that a bit later. But, you know, the usual place to start is a bit about yourselves personally and your backstories. So tell us a bit about what you were doing before, how and why did you get into cannabis? Stephen, would you like to start? Sure, sure. So I'm a medical doctor by training. I uh, have been uh, a medical doctor for about 35 years. Spent most of my career in the uh, cancer diagnostic space. I trained, I did a fellowship in clinical pathology and started what is now the Quest Diagnostics Labs in Savannah Hilton Head in Charleston. I, I had a lab that I sold to them. Stayed on as a medical director for that company for about uh, five years and then started a company specializing in artificial intelligence for specifically cancer diagnostics. I'm an inventor on uh, more than 40 patents in the artificial intelligence world, one of the first guys to use it in medicine on a full-time basis. And we developed a number of different things throughout my career, a, a, a way to look at uh, malignant calcification versus benign calcification on mammography, looking at the human genome for four genes that actually were successful in diagnosing prostate cancer, uh, the first iPhone app for melanoma detection, which allowed you to take a picture of, of the lesion and it would tell you if it was a high, low or moderate risk of being melanoma. Uh, and I primarily worked academically uh, with uh, J the guys from Johns Hopkins, MD Anderson, Stanford and Memorial Sloan Kettering. And as chairman and CEO of both private and public companies, I personally have negotiated and done deals with Pfizer and with uh, Novartis, Quest, Abbott, many of the larger companies in the pharmaceutical and biotech space. And in 2012, I retired from running a publicly traded company. We took them from inception to profitability. And I retired at that point. In 2013, my mother got pancreatic cancer. And because of my career, I was able to I uh, get one of the top guys in the world for pancreatic cancer to treat her. And he was using a special chemotherapy that at the time he was one of the only people in the world allowed to use because it was still experimental. Now it's actually approved by the FDA for pancreatic cancer. And it was working. It was uh, reducing the tumor size. It was uh, bringing it off of the great vessel so that we could be potentially preparing her for surgery. But the problem was she had intractable nausea for about three and a half months where she could eat nothing. And so at that point, she had lost down to 88 pounds, which is kind of typical with some of these cancer patients from cachexia. And I called the doctor and I said, look, if we don't get her some food, if we can't get her to eat, she's going to die of starvation and not pancreatic cancer. We already had her on IV nutrition at that point. And the suggestion from the doctor was to put her on medical cannabis. Well, that was a shock to me because I came out of a very strict traditional medical world. I had no idea that that was going to be the recommendation, but I was willing to do anything to try to save her at that point. And I told him, I said, you know, I'll do anything I, that, that, that will help, but she is not going to smoke weed. I said, she's 76 years old. She's probably not even going to let me in her house with it. And he said, no, 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 you're going to get this medical device that will vape it. And she, it looks like much like what patients that have COPD and asthma use. 
And she already took three vapes a day for her COPD. So he said, don't tell her what it is. Don't bias her. Just tell her it's a fourth vape for her lungs that we want her to take. So I said, okay. So I got it. I got it. I did it. And sure enough, about 10 minutes after I gave her the first dose, she looked at me and said, my nausea is gone. And that was the first time she had said that in three and a half months. And about 10 minutes later, she asked if she could eat something. And we started feeding her. And so what happened after that was I did this three times a day before each meal. And in the first week, we got three pounds on her, which wasn't a lot, but she was now up to 91 pounds and the IV nutrition was stopped and she was actually eating again. She went in for additional chemotherapy the following week and she was still quite weak, you can imagine. And the nurse gave her apple juice in a glass instead of through a straw and she aspirated on the apple juice and she died three days later of aspiration pneumonia and not even pancreatic cancer. And so that's when I came out of retirement and basically said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to understand medical cannabis. And was this a fluke or was this real? And initially I got into it just with the assumption that if it's real, then even if cancer patients like her could use it for the nausea so that they can still continue eating, because I feel like had I known about this three months before I did, she may not have lost all that weight and she could have finished her treatment. This would be a great thing for cancer patients. And so I started really studying medical cannabis and trying to learn as much as I could. And with my partner, Dr. Herb Fritchie, who we worked together for probably 35 years, he was the head of clinical chemistry and a professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston for 42 years. And so he's one of the world experts in this space of clinical chemistry. So what we did was about 2015, we were asked to come down and give a talk at the medical school in Jamaica about medical cannabis because they were about to go medically legal and they wanted to try to learn as much as they could about how to use it. So we went down and we gave this talk and we had quite a big turnout at the medical school. And then the next day I was asked if I would consider moving to Jamaica and opening a federally legal treatment facility that, to use uh, medical cannabis to treat patients where we could actually do clinical trial type work and we could study this in large numbers of patients and things that we couldn't do in the United States. And as a result of that, I, uh, said yes and moved to Jamaica. I didn't really intend on living in a third world country initially when I retired, but Jamaica is a wonderful place and it's got wonderful people. And so I was living down there full time for the first uh, couple of years, uh, establishing this facility. And the results that we're seeing now are just spectacular, not only for chemotherapy with nausea, but many, many conditions, including cancer treatment itself. Wow. Thank you for sharing that story. It's interesting to hear kind of that firsthand experience of dealing with cancer patients and it clearly really motivating kind of factor for you. Yes, absolutely. The whole reason that I came out of retirement to do this was to solely try to see if we had stumbled upon something that would be able to help cancer patients. And Apollon was originally started strictly as a family company with me and my uh, all adult children in honor of my mother to try to see if we could help cancer patients along the way using medical cannabis. Yeah, thank you. We'll come on to a bit more about what Apollon does, but maybe Rod, would you mind just uh, saying hello as well? <laughs> sure, look, my story uh, is slightly more benign than uh, Dr. Barnhill's. I'm not sort of qualified in this space at all. My, my history goes back to my parents, uh, cattle farmers. So I kind of grew up on a farm, I have a bit of an affinity for nature and I understand how the natural world operates from sort of the seasonal aspect and, and the various living off the land side of the process. And, and Dr. Barnhill and I were introduced to each other uh, through a mutual friend. And one of the things that I quickly saw in him was that he was clearly an expert in the space, a self-taught expert in the space and, and, and in the space that was sort of an emerging situation. And um, at the time, my my father was suffering from one of the areas that Dr. Barnhill was researching, which was prostate cancer, and he offered to treat my father 
at the facility, but you know, I don't know whether you or actually you mentioned that you're married to a, a Eastern States girl who comes from the sort of the rural area, so maybe you know the guys that live on the land in Australia they don't leave. You know, they certainly don't go to the other side of the world. They they born, grow up, and die on the farm. And but setting that aside, what what I sort of realised through that in sort of I guess uh, early engagement with Dr. Barnhill was really just you know what a, what a great guy was. Uh, you know, he, he's an altruistic sort of a medical professional that wants to make it work and, and that's really where I kind of got married to the idea and I just brought my my network and the ability to bring this to a public market here in the UK and, and support him in any way that he needed supporting. So that's that's my role and we've built a team um, around him here to do the administrative and the sort of the everything that goes with it. You know, obviously there's lots of different moving parts in a publicly listed company and we're all there to make sure that this works. So in a nanosecond, that's my, my version of it. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. Cheers for sharing that. And good that you guys came together. And you mentioned the, you know, public listing. We'll, we'll come and talk about that in a second. But why don't we take a step back and why don't you talk to Barnhill? Would you want to maybe give us an overview of what Apollon is and what it does? Sure. So Apollon is a medical cannabis pharmaceutical company. And we develop formulations specific to certain diseases. We develop IP around in individual strains for specific conditions. And then we take that through to creating formulations that specifically address certain issues. So in Jamaica, we've actually been very successful in that we won uh, the High Times Cannabis Cup for one of our uh, strains in the Indica division, first place. Uh, we have won the Jack Hara Cup for best medical solvent oil. And our treatment facility in Jamaica won first place in the world out of uh, medical cannabis resort type treatment facilities by Edibles Magazine. And uh, the runners up were two in Europe, two in Canada, two in the US, I believe. So we're very proud of the accomplishment we've had down there, but we also have been treating patients. We have a full medical staff down there. We have a staff of neurosurgeons and oncologists, palliative care specialists, family practitioners, all of whom specialize in their own field, all of whom are licensed, but also all of whom have been trained specifically in medical cannabis treatment. So uh, all of the patients that come down to us are overseen by doctors that are specialized in the type of treatment we're offering. And it's not just cancer. We do opioid addiction, we do ulcerative colitis, we do chronic pain, we do all the typical things that you know of uh, that cannabis is used for. But we're, we're sort of known for our pioneering research in cancer. And we have, a, as I said, a world-renowned clinical chemist who's our chief science officer who helps us do these things. I can tell you Dr. Fritchie, who is, is, is from MD Anderson for 42 years, basically said to me, you know, Steve, the 42 years I've been doing this and the 35 years you've been doing this together, these results are the most exciting cancer results I've seen in my career. And so it's very exciting what we have going on. I have to tell you, and if, if you had told me 10 years ago when I was deep in the root of mostly academic artificial intelligence medicine, that I would win the cannabis cup and the Jack Hara cup, and have the top uh, prize worldwide for Edibles magazine, I would have thought that you were smoking something. <laughs> but, but, you know, life has a funny way of moving the right things around when things hit you with personal tragedy. And I intend to spend the rest of my life working specifically in this field as long as I can to try to see how we can help these patients with medical cannabis. I came into it, as I told you, with no expectation that it would work looking because of my background in traditional clinical proof, looking to see if this was a fluke. But in the end of the day, I can tell you sitting here today, this absolutely works. I'm blown away by how well it works in many conditions. And we hope to continue to advancing the medical side of this field going forward. Yeah. And so it sounds like research is clearly a very key and important part of what you do. Absolutely. And, and in Jamaica, <clears throat> we have all the licenses that we need to do that. We can cultivate for research purposes. We have the research and development license, 
which allows us to do that. We have a medical therapeutic dispensary license, which allows us to also apply the medicines. We have a processing license and we have a full pharmaceutical level processing facility down in Jamaica where we process our oils. So we have a, a full uh, suite of licenses and we're able to do all of the aspects of medical cannabis down there. And then we also can take the patients that we're treating and take that information and make it more widely available through publications and spread through export our products around the world. You know, with, with medical cannabis, it's just like any other medical drug. If we show that a certain formulation works in a certain dose, that formulation, that dose is what has to be used around the world, right? I, I often say a Tylenol is a Tylenol is a Tylenol, right? No matter where we buy a Tylenol in the world, it's the exact same product, with the exact same dose and the exact same chemical. And this is where I think that medical cannabis has to go because as we prove that it works in certain conditions, then we have to replicate that dose. You can't just go into a dispensary and buy any dose of any product. It's a very specialized product. To make that point even stronger, I can tell you that we treat, for example, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patients different than we treat triple negative breast cancer patients, right? The formulations are different. The way they're treated is different. And so you really have to have that knowledge and understanding. Otherwise, you won't get the right successful result that you're looking for. And what I see going on, if, if, if there's not more work like we're doing going on, where people just go into a dispensary and they say, here, take this for your cancer or take that for your cancer. And if it doesn't work, it's not the fault of the medicine. It's the fault of the practitioner that doesn't understand how to use the medicine. So we're trying to standardize this around the world using patient data from Jamaica. And in Jamaica, because of our licenses and because of our medical staff, we are allowed to treat and do treat a lot of patients with medical cannabis. So we are growing every day our database of knowledge for how to use this properly. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. And good to make that point around standardization because it's a topic that comes up on the show quite a lot and the inherent difficulty of standardizing a plant material That's right. is always a challenge. Yeah, it's critical. And, and I think that, you know, with, without that standardization, that's backed by clinical data in real patients, then you really aren't, aren't doing what I consider true medical cannabis treatment. Yeah, fantastic. So then maybe we'll just move on to a little bit of the more corporate side of things. Roger, you'll get a chance to, to chat. You guys just had, you know, recently IPO'd. Tell us a bit about that process and, and how's that kind of changed things for Apollon? Sure. Well, you know, <laughs> As with all overnight successes, and there's there, there are many years in the making, <laughs> this was a journey I think that we, we, we didn't anticipate it sort of going on to, to this level of time. But we are listed on the Aquis Exchange. And one of the reasons that we're listed down there going back two and a half, three years was that they were taking the position similar to what the Canadian Stock Exchange did uh, in North America. Where, where they were going to kind of self-regulate the medical cannabis space because they saw a niche there. They wanted to be first mover into that space before the FCA issued their guidance. And we worked for a period of time looking at sort of various opportunities, whether it was a straight IPO or whether we were going to use an existing shell. And ultimately, we ended up sort of what is called in a, in a reverse takeover situation where we sort of merged Apollon into an existing shell, renamed that shell, replaced all the management and sort of issued the equity to the Apollon team and have now sort of conducted that IPO. That process took a lot longer than we thought it was going to do for, for various reasons. Obviously, we all know what happened last year. and You know, there's just all these things called unknown unknowns, right? But we are there now. And one of the things that is shortly about to sort of take place or, or, you know, from the purposes of when this is published, historically will have taken place is that we're about to start our drive now. You know, the facility has been renovated. The licences are all in good shape. We have uh, the cultivation about to start. We have, a, a, you know, state-of-the-art processing facility down there that we are now moving to sort of GMP and E-GMP. 
uh, status over the next sort of you know se- several months, let's say. So what we have here is we didn't raise a lot of money in the IPO process because this was already built out by the investors in that sort of preceding three-year period. You know, prior to the IPO, there was around about sort of 4.8 million in US that in, in its entirety was invested to build this, get the licenses, get the get everything to, to where it is. And we're there now. So we don't, what we have is a scalable situation that, you know, Dr. Barnhill and his team are going to take forward. So I, you know, from from where we were when we first met to where we were now, we've, we've really come a long way. As I said, it's taken a long time, but, uh, you know, I, I sort of have seen over the last couple of years where the team, the medical team here is, is going to drive this. And, you know, th- this is one of those investments that, you know, I've just sort of, it's a bottom drawer. You just you kind of, I've just invested in it with my network and we're going to see where it goes. So very happy to be involved, to be quite honest. Brilliant. And just to quickly follow on from that, how do you see the market kind of hot, hotting up, you know, with the more listings with the FCA kind of mm. announcement on, on those things? And then, you know, there's been some big M&A activity as well. well what sure. are your thoughts on that? Well, look, I mean, the way that I've sort of seen it was that there was a bit of a rush of blood to the FCA issued its guidance. The markets were open. There was a rush to be the first, second, third. That all kind of happened in a, in a hail of bullets, let's call it. And what what sort of came from that as, as a sort of as, as the company that was sitting on the sidelines watching this sort of occur was that each one of these organisations that was listing was, for all intent and purpose, one of our product lines within our organisation. So... You know, everything that you kind of see on the market at the moment, all each one of those individually is housed within the Apple on brand. And you know, the, from the hemp, the CBD through to the really what really I think sets Apple on aside from an investor's point of view is their their research and development, their human experimentation. You know, maybe Dr. Barnhill will go into more detail of why that occurs, why that license is available in Jamaica, but in a simple sense, this allows us, and it's from what I've seen, it's it's a globally unique uh, licensing situation that is a very low cost entry to defining the efficacy of your formulations on people that are, have you know, human ailments. Let's say so. I think that that particular aspect is the core that the rest of the business hangs off. You know, we've got CBD vapes, we've got tinctures, we've got the entire thing is there, but the real business, the real future of this is that big data, you know, sort of chasing down efficacy on human conditions. So, yeah, it's, you know, I'm a believer after seeing some of the things that Steve's done. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, very exciting. And thank you for that. Cool. So let's maybe drill down and talk a bit more about Jamaica specifically. I mean, obviously... It's very synonymous with cannabis, Bob Marley, cliche, et cetera. Stephen, would you mind just giving us a little bit of, you know, background on, you know, maybe as well with a reflection of why you decided to base yourself out there as well? Maybe a bit of the historic kind of angle of, of cannabis in Jamaica? Sure, sure. So as I said, the reason I ended up in Jamaica myself personally was because we wanted to be able to do real studies on real patients. And that really wasn't allowed in the U.S. It wasn't allowed in Europe. Uh, If I were going to get the kind of information that I required of myself to satisfy my mind that this was real, that I had to collect that sort of data in a location where it was federally legal to collect that sort of data. And I got tremendous support from some of the government officials in Jamaica to actually come down and do that. Jamaica is a beautiful country and Jamaicans are beautiful people. And I tell you, it has been a, a true honor experience to have lived down there and to continue to operate down there. You're right. They say the best ganja in the world is grown in Jamaica. And uh, and in Jamaica, they say the best ganja in Jamaica is grown in Orange Hill, which is the, where Bob Marley grew his and also where our farm was that we grew the award winning strain. Right. So. It's very well known. Uh, they have a lot of, uh, of very professional growers down there, though they, they don't, they're not 
you know, indoor computerized, it's all out in the sun. You know, if you look at, for example, some of the indoor greenhouses, if you will, where these are growing in Canada and the U S and all that, that are all run by computers and, and everything's preset. What they're all preset to is Jamaica, right? Same humidity, the same amount of sunlight, the same amount. I always tell people, God bless Saudi Arabia with oil and they bless, and he blessed Jamaica with ganja. And so they, it really, we've been very happy with, with the products that we can produce down there. And as I said, the growers have a lot of experience, although a lot of them have been growing for a lot of years before it was legal. But now we have the, the, their expertise and knowledge from all of those years of growing to help us. And uh, of course, you have the Rastafari community down there, which is also wonderful people. I have many friends uh, in the Rastafari community. In fact, our, our director of cultivation is the Rastafari priest. And, you know, again, they look at this as something even more than medical. It's sacramental. And it's a big part of their faith in what they do. And so it's, it's a very respected thing. And uh, even our medical director, uh, Dr. Anthony Hall, is a board certified neurosurgeon. He was born in Kingston, but he moved to Canada uh, in his teens with his mother, ended up going to medical school at McGill and did his surgery training in New York and did his neurosurgery training in Florida. Uh, he's an extraordinarily experienced uh, brain and spine surgeon. Uh, but he also works in Jamaica with us, and he's a Rastafari from his early days. So he comes at it from a very strong medical perspective as well as a sacramental perspective, which I think is wonderful. But that's sort of the the background of Jamaica and cannabis, or as yeah. they say, Kanja down there. A lot of people were arrested and persecuted and and fought against that to try to keep this plant alive, and now Jamaica is flourishing from being one of the first countries in the Caribbean to allow it to be federally legal. It's it's such a interesting and kind of almost unique territory in relation to this because of the like religious connection to it and the sacramental and spiritual connection to it. It, How is that just kind of medical cannabis is sort of, you know, in the medical setting is quite necessarily stricter and regulated and all this. How does that sort of juxtapose with the kind of more native attitudes towards cannabis in in Jamaica. Is there a difference or has it been accepted quite nicely? It's being accepted much more. You know, there there were a lot of people that were deeply religious, uh, more on the Christian religious side, that were very against it initially. However, now that they see it working, you'd be surprised how many of them actually come in for treatment now at, at this point because they do see that it's working well and it, it, it is a good thing. In fact, our Rastafari priest, Adi, who is, uh, as I told you, uh, the director of cultivation, he was explaining, I was with him at the Minister of Justice's office one day when they were saying, yes, but your Rastafari ganja is sacramental. It's not medical. And his answer was, it's sacramental because it's medical, right? We saw the healing powers of this plant. We saw how it was helping people and that's why it became sacramental right and so i think there's that strong connection between sacramental rastafari beliefs about ganja and the medical side all of which are leading toward how do you help people with it and they embrace what we're doing because they know they've seen through years and years and years of using it the medical benefit but now they have a group of doctors and a company in Jamaica that is proving the science that they knew all along for many years. They just didn't have a way to prove it and why it works. Right. That, I mean, that's a brilliant way of sort of summarizing it. And in terms of cultivation, is it all outdoor grown and are they kind of almost like land race sort of cultivars that you're growing out there? Yes. Right now it's, it's, almost exclusively outdoor growing. There's some people putting up greenhouses and things like that. But even in that case, it's not the typical greenhouse that you think about that they would use in Toronto, right? It's a greenhouse with an open roof because they want the sun. But, uh, you know, a lot of that is you want to control what's blowing in and out because you don't want an accidental cross hybridization or something. 
but we grew plants that were seven, seven and a half feet tall, all outdoor, all growing organically. You know, they also don't put a bunch of chemicals in it. Uh, it's all organic grow. If you if you went to our, our initial farm, before you saw all the cannabis plants, you saw a whole bunch of animals, goats and pigs, and because they use natural fertilizer for these plants. The Rastafari also don't put things in their body that are bad. And that's why some of the original organic growing techniques, I think, came out of that community. Fantastic. Yeah, very interesting. And in, within Jamaica, what's the setup around medical cannabis? Is it being prescribed by doctors or what's the root kind of administration? And what's the level of doctor education? Because as we know, across the world, that's something that really needs a lot of help. What's the situation in, in Jamaica? In Jamaica, the doctors are, that are working with us are prescribing it. They know how to prescribe it. They know the doses. A lot of the other doctors are just learning. We're setting up an educational program to teach them. It's kind of the same in the UK. I, I was The last time I was there, before COVID stopped all the travel, you know, I was asked by a group there if I would give a talk at Cambridge University to doctors in the UK to teach them how to write a cannabis prescription. Because though it's legal and certain doctors can write for it, I was told that many of them don't know how to write a cannabis prescription. And so we were going to give a talk and, and teach them. The people that invited me to do that actually said, we can't promise you the walls of Cambridge University won't crash on your head when you're talking about this there, but we'll give it a go. So when things open back up, we intend to increase our educational training in for the doctors in the UK as well as in Jamaica. And one of the things that, that differentiates us, as Rod was talking about, is that we are allowed to use high THC levels in our products. You have some companies that are going public now in the UK and other places that are CBD companies. And while CBD is a good product for certain conditions, for certain things like cancer, you have to have high THC levels. They work simultaneously with each other. And other cannabinoids like CBG, the, the stem cell of, of, of the cannabinoids, we our formulations include that. And if you're going to properly treat patients, you have to have that. So we, we are very happy to be one of the only companies in the UK that can use high THC formulations because of our licenses in Jamaica. That's brilliant. And what is the, the kind of export relationship? How does Jamaica fit into the international medical cannabis market? So they are finalizing now in Parliament the export regulations, which hopefully will be released sometime very soon. They, they were, were to have been released already, but COVID slowed them down. But that's not stopping them. If you are a licensed company like we are, and you have a legal licensed company that wants to import your product from Jamaica, they will give you approval for those sales on a one-off basis until the final regulations come out. So we can move our product and we do get a lot of interest in our products because we actually have data that show they work, right? So you can imagine if, if you're looking for products in, in, a, in a country to treat cancer patients, do you want a product that has no data that's never been shown to work just because it's cannabis oil? Or do you want a product that has a clinical and laboratory data supporting that it actually might help the patient? And of course, that, that's why we get so many calls and why our products are in demand. And that's why we put such a large processing facility in place down there. Yeah, that's, it's really interesting. And then looking to the future as we sort of get towards the end, you know, what are some of the challenges that you see for the Jamaican kind of medical cannabis industry? And, and maybe what are some of the opportunities on the flip of that? Well, I think the opportunities are that if you're fully licensed, you have the ability to do things in Jamaica uh, that you aren't allowed to do in many other countries of the world because they're not as advanced in their federal legal system with medical cannabis as Jamaica is. Uh, by the way, even in Jamaica, recreational or what, what's called adult use cannabis is not legal. It's decriminalized, but it's not legal. But medical cannabis is what they legalized. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for companies to come down there that want to do medical testing 
and to be able to treat patients and keep records and, and things like that so you can follow the data. One of the other things that we're doing, which is very exciting, is we are going to be collecting blood samples on all the patients so that we can look at the human genome, right, which is kind of my background uh, using AI with the human genome. So that let's say you have a patient with breast cancer and 50% of them do very well and 50% of them don't do very well. Then you can go into the human genome and find out, is there a genetic reason? Is there a biomarker telling you which ones will do well and which ones don't? So say the ones that do well have a certain genetic piece of information. That's how we did for the prostate cancer, for, for example, by the way, with the, with the test we developed. Now, all of a sudden, you can triage patients using the genome into the correct therapy, which is exactly what happens with chemotherapy. As you know, if you, if you have breast cancer, they want to know, are you estrogen receptor positive? Are you triple negative? Are you uh, HER2 positive? That sends you to the correct therapy, right? Same with lung cancers and all, all the different types of cancers. That's what we really, that was really my specialty was cancer diagnostic biomarkers and triage before. So we're going to do the same thing now with cannabis. So if you have a certain condition, we can use artificial intelligence to, de de to define whether you have a genetic benefit from this type of cannabis treatment or that type of cannabis treatment or some other treatment. And so I believe we're the first in the world to be using the human genome with artificial intelligence in our program to try to triage patients correctly to the right therapy. Wow, that sounds really exciting and very interesting. We could probably go into a lot more detail on that, but a bunch, unfortunately the time is getting towards the end. I would like to say thank you to both of you actually for joining me today. It was a real pleasure and great to sort of scratch the surface on what's happening in Jamaica, really, really exciting stuff. And I particularly like all the education focus that you have because it's a key theme of the show. So. I'd love to get involved if there's an opportunity to do that. That would be wonderful. Thank you for having us. No, real pleasure. We'd always like to come back when you have time with it. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Thank you, guys. Thank you.